Election Day, if you want to, you can stage a protest anywhere in America on a subject of your choosing. It's a free country. And if you want to stage your protest on Election Day, you might want to stage that protest where you know you will have basically a captive audience and a captive audience with politics on their minds. You might want to stage your protest at a place where people are voting, at a polling site. You have the right to do that. You have the free speech right to do that. But because we also have laws that protect prospective voters as they go to fulfill their constitutional right to vote, you can protest outside a polling place on Election Day, but you can only get so close when you do it. You have to abide by a protective buffer zone so you don't interfere with or intimidate or unduly influence people as they go about casting their vote. The size of that buffer zone varies from state to state. In, say, the state of Massachusetts, you have to stay 150 feet away from the entrance of a polling place when voting is underway. But there are also buffer zone laws at military funerals. If you're someone who believes that the best use of your time is to protest at the funerals of American service members, and there are people who believe that, God bless their souls, well, the U.S. Constitution and our right to free speech means that you have a right to protest at funerals. But, again, buffer zone. Federal law says that you can get no closer than 300 feet to the entrance of that military funeral that you are protesting. That's how the law and the courts balance that particular right to free speech with the rights of the loved ones of that fallen service member not to be harassed and terrorized as they attend the funeral of that person they loved. Same general idea, actually, for protesters at the Supreme Court of the United States. If you're protesting at the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C., whether you're happy with the Supreme Court or mad at them or anything in between, if you're protesting at the court, you have to stay a certain distance away from the entrance to the court. There are no protests of any kind, no public demonstrations of any kind allowed anywhere on the 250-foot plaza of the Supreme Court. So if you want to protest at the court, you're welcome to. But there's a very specific geographic limit on that right, which gives the court effectively a 250-foot geographical buffer zone from any protests. On December 30th, 1994, a man with a gun, 22-year-old man, walked into the Planned Parenthood Clinic in Brookline, Massachusetts. He walked up to the receptionist and he said, is this Planned Parenthood? And when the receptionist told him it was, he shot her and he killed her. And he was not done. Eyewitnesses say he arrived dressed in black, pulled out a 22 caliber rifle, and as they tried to flee, opened fire. The gunman shot four people before escaping here. One woman, a clinic worker, died at the scene. But the terror wasn't over. Just 10 minutes later, a similar attack at a clinic blocks away by a gunman also dressed in black. He drops the duffel bag, pulls out a rifle, and I was stunned when I saw the rifle. Before he hit, he shoots the girl I'm talking to. She falls. Three people were injured at the second clinic, including one woman who died at the hospital. A massive manhunt involving federal, state, and local police agencies is underway. But authorities stopped short of saying the same gunman carried out both attacks. We are presently in the beginning phase of an intensive investigation to find the individual or individuals. The two clinics are just a mile and a half apart, and anti-abortion activists have protested frequently at both. Clinic officials confirm that both clinics received death threats over the last few weeks. That gunman uh, killed two women that day in Brookline. It was the same guy. Uh, the people he killed were Shannon Lowney and Leanne Nichols killed them both on the same day in 1994. They were both receptionists at two different clinics on the same street in Brookline. The gunman then got away. Uh, he fled to Virginia, it turns out, where he kept up the rampage. He shot into the doors of another abortion clinic in Norfolk, Virginia, but then he was captured by police. The clinics where the shootings happened, where two people were killed and five people were shot and wounded, those two clinics were routine targets for anti-abortion protesters at the time. According to contemporaneous reports, an hour after that gunman killed Shannon Lowney at the Brookline Planned Parenthood, somebody called that same clinic and told a counselor there who answered the phone, quote, you got what you deserved. Shannon Lowney's family later announced they were creating a fund to help provide protection at clinics, both for the patients 
who attended the clinics and for the employees who work there. Eventually, the state of Massachusetts did pass a specific law aimed at protecting those people. In 2000, Massachusetts Republican Governor Paul Cellucci signed a new law that said, even though you can protest outside a clinic that provides abortion services, you cannot get closer than 18 feet to the entrance. That's principle is why you see those yellow lines painted on the ground around some of the entrances to some clinics in Massachusetts. Those lines are there so people know they can state their case. They can say whatever they want. They just can't physically approach the people entering a clinic or the clinic's patients. Then in 2007, that buffer zone law in Massachusetts, which was enacted after those two young women were shot and killed, uh, that buffer zone law was strengthened to 35 feet. And it is that 2007 law from Massachusetts, the 35-foot buffer zone, that law is now awaiting word on its fate from the United States Supreme Court. In a case very similar to this in 2000, the court ruled in favor of Colorado's version of this law. But this year, everybody sort of expects that this, the court's going to rule against the Massachusetts buffer zone, or, or at least that they're going to weaken it. The court has heard the oral arguments in the Massachusetts case already. They're expected to rule on it in June. And of course, if they do rule against the 35-foot buffer zone, which is designed to protect patients seeking access to those clinics and the staff who work at those clinics, that ruling could have reverberations, not just for Massachusetts, but for any state with a similar buffer zone set up for clinics that provide abortion. And not just abortion clinics, military funerals other places where buffer zones limit free speech geographically in the name of protecting other rights, polling places, the Supreme Court itself. Today, of course, is the anniversary of the Supreme Court's landmark ruling protecting a woman's right to get an abortion in this country. 41 years ago today was Roe versus Wade. President Obama today put out a statement praising that decision, calling the right to get an abortion in this country part of, quote, reproductive freedom. Also in Washington today, because it is the anniversary of Roe, anti-abortion protesters took to the National Mall for their big annual anti-abortion rally. It's something they do every year. They call it the March for Life. Republican elected officials always, always speak at the March for Life. But this year, the Republican Party sort of tripled down on their support for this march. They delayed the start of the Republican Party's annual winter meeting so members of the RNC could go to the march and not miss any of the meeting. The chairman of the Republican National Committee himself attended the march, and the RNC chartered a bus. They provided bus service to and from the march for RNC members. At their winter meeting, once it got underway, once everybody had had their chance to go marching against abortion rights, the RNC introduced a big new anti-abortion resolution for its members, stating that Republican candidates for office must stop shying away from being anti-abortion. They should loudly declare how anti-abortion they are. And if a Republican candidate for office does not talk enough about just how against abortion rights they are, this resolution says the RNC should not support that strategy as that candidate runs for office. Office. Republican National Committee set to vote on that new be louder about being anti-abortion resolution uh, by Friday of this week. Meanwhile, in Congress, they're considering these measures, not just a matter of marching in the streets and dealing with the Supreme Court. Legislature matters here, too. And in Congress, Republicans control the House of Representatives. The Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives, uh, specifically the Republican majority on the Judiciary Committee of the House of Representatives, which looks like this, all these lovely ladies, uh, they decided that the first bill they would mark up in 2014, the way they would start this new session of Congress, the very first thing they would work on would be the No Taxpayer Funding for Abortion Act, which concerns abortion coverage and whether or not Washington, D.C. is allowed to spend even its own money, even non-federal money, providing access to abortion for low-income women in that city. That was the very first thing that the Republican-controlled House Judiciary Committee decided to work on this year. And all the male Republicans on that committee, which is all the Republicans on that committee, unanimously voted for it. But not before telling the one representative of Washington, D.C. in Congress, Eleanor Holmes Norton, that she would not be allowed to speak on the issue. Republicans in the House are also expecting this year to make their most concerted push ever for a federal nationwide ban that would criminalize abortion all across the country at 20 weeks or later. 
The House voted to pass a 20-week ban last year. This year, they are on a renewed push for it. They think they can try to get it through the Senate, too. They're going to mount a concerted effort to target centrist Democrats, hoping that, that those centrist Democratic votes and all the Republican votes in the Senate would help them get that abortion ban through the Democratic-controlled Senate, whereupon it would be promptly vetoed by President Obama. The Supreme Court just last week struck down Arizona's version of a 20-week ban on abortion, or rather they allowed to stand a lower court ruling that had struck down the Arizona law. But House Republicans still say they want that for the whole country. They think this is the year they're going to be able to get it passed. And as we await probably an yet another ruling on 20-week bans, federally clarifying that issue after what they did with Arizona, and as we await the judicial fate of the Massachusetts buffer zone law that passed after that fatal rampage in Brookline and created a safety buffer zone around those clinics, as we await those things judicially, the Republican Party, not just in the states but in Washington, is declaring that more than anything else, more than any other policy issue in the country, the one thing that unifies the Republican Party in the United States is how opposed they are to abortion rights. War and peace, spending versus not spending, hands-off government versus hands-on government, guns, gays, the Voting Rights Act. I mean, there are real differences of opinion among elected Republicans on all of those issues. But on abortion, unity. There is one Republican position on which you can say there is unity. And they are putting it at the forefront of what it means to be a Republican. They think it's not just the right thing to do. They think it's going to work for them strategically. Why do they think that? And what does it mean for our politics?